by faith. By what? Faith. By faith. Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his who? Of his house or his family, by which, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Let's pray together as we invite the presence of the Lord once more in this sacred hour. Father in heaven, we now come once more pleading that you would please come. Come into our heart. Come into this place. And may you protect our minds and protect our hearts so that we might be able to focus on your word. Lord, speak for your servants here. And as for me, I really have nothing to offer. I am nothing but dust. And Lord, therefore, I ask that you please use me as your mouthpiece today. Speak through me. Hide me behind the cross and cover me with the blood of Jesus so that he might be uplifted in his amazing grace as we hear that song. In Jesus' name, amen. A young man went to an interview in a very big company. He passed the written exam and, and finally he was at the stage of the final interview. The director sat down with this young man and looked at his CV. And when he looked at the, the resume, he, he saw that this man had a lot of academic achievement. And with his academic achievement, the director asked, how did you pay for your school? Did you have a scholarship to, to have such a good, you know, uh, beautiful and, and, and accomplishment? The young man said, no, sir. My parents paid for my school. And then the director asked, so what does your parents do? Are they rich? Do you have a lot of money? Is that why? He said, no, sir. They are washing clothes to pay for my education. And the director was surprised at the success and achievement of this young man. So the director asked, can I please see your hands? And he saw that it was smooth and no wrinkle and all perfect shape and uh, just in perfect condition. And then he realized that this young man had never washed clothes in his entire life. Well, he said, sir, I never washed clothes because my parents said, go ahead and keep reading and studying and read more books. Focus in your study. And then the director said, well, young man, tonight as you go home, I do have one request. I want you to go and wash your parents' hand before you go to bed tonight. He did. He went home. He washed his parents' hand. And for the first time, he touched his parents' wrinkle, bruised, ruined hand. The hand that had paid for his school. The hand that made sacrifice so that he could become successful and achieve great and wonderful grades at school. And tears started falling his face because he realized that these are the hand that sacrifice all so that I may go somewhere in life. You see, friends, our topic for today and our study for today is about Noah and his family. Noah, and as a parent, and I know that many of you here as a parent, you would do everything to... To, to, to give your children the best in the world. Amen? And many of you have. You have given the best of your years, of your time, and your effort to bring the best and the best to your children. No parents in the world, except something wrong with their head, no parents in the world would want any harm for their children. And today's study is about Noah and his family and the sacrifice that he made and, and the effort that he made. Not blessing his children only with material things, but with an eternal perspective of salvation. The, the study for today is called, Lord, Save My Family. A study again of Noah and his family. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me into the book of Genesis the story of Noah and his family and that he did all that he can by his example and his life to save his family. You're turning there, the book of Genesis chapter 6. 
where it all began. Genesis chapter 6. Adam, in the context, Adam lived to see all of his descendants up to ninth generation, except Noah. Noah is the only, one of the grandsons that he never got to see because 126 years before Noah was born, Adam passed away. And so 126 years later, Noah was born. And Noah was born in a time when the earth was growing. The year was about 2687 B.C., just 120 years before the flood came. We find a story here in chapter 6 of Genesis. The Bible tells us in verse 1, are you there? Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass where men began to what? Multiply. Not addition, but multiplication. Men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And daughters were born to who? To them. So the Bible says that there was an explosion of population. As time went on, there was a lot of people that were born. Multiplication, numbers, an explosion in growth in population. You know, in 2000, the growth rate of population is about 0 0.012. And with our increase of population, basically, if that was the growth of the population in the days of Noah, there would have been 750 million people. Remember, they had 1,000 or 1,200 years from Adam all the way to Noah. So if the growth rate was just 0 0.012, that would be 750 million people. That's a lot of people. But if you add, just add, because remember that people live to be average 900 years. That's a very long time. An average of 900 years. Imagine, uh, I have an auntie that, you know, now is in her 60s, and she had 12 kids. Imagine if you have 900, if you live 900 years, how many kids you could bring forth into the world? That's a lot of kids, isn't it? And so uh, the average, uh, uh, but if you just add a little bit, increase it by just 0 0.001 with that population in the days of Noah, that could be 4 billion people. That's a lot of people. If you just increase it by 0 0.001, that's a lot of people. Amen. So the Bible said that there was a multiplication, not addition, but multiplication of people. And as a result, this basically populated the earth. And in the days of, of Noah, the double curse, double curse rested upon the earth. But this has not changed nature. The hills were crowned with majestic trees, supporting fruit-laden branches of the vine. The vast garden-like plains were clothed with verdure and the sweet with fragrance of thousand flowers. This was a beautiful location to be. The people was in good condition. The people were in good health. They have retained almost the original state when God created Adam from the beginning. The curse rested, but yet we can see the beautiful scenery of nature. Nothing has changed much from the creation up to the time of Noah. The trees far surpass in size, beauty, and perfection and proportion today compared to the days of Noah. Gold, silver, and precious stones were in abundance during this time. And people were healthy. And as a result, they reproduced in multiplication. Remember, the average age was how long? About 969. A little, a little Bible trivia. Who was the oldest person? that live and die. I have to say live and die because, you know, Methuselah, how old was he? 969, right? Methuselah was 969. He was the oldest person that lived and died. 969. However, as they multiplied, there became a big gap and distinction between believers and unbelievers. Those who be God and those who follow the worldly ways. And then in verse 2 and verse 4 of Genesis chapter 6, the Bible tells us that the sons of who? The sons of God saw that the who? 
the daughters of man, that they were what? They were beautiful. I don't believe that. I don't believe that the sons of the world were more beautiful than the sons or the daughters of the church. Maybe because they put something on. That could be one of the, the ways, right? But he said that the sons of God, who were these sons of God? Some people believe that the sons of God were angels coming down into marriage with men. But that is not true. The sons of God, in fact, if you go throughout the Old Testament, every time God called out his son, uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, God said, I am calling my son Israel out of Egypt, my firstborn son. So whenever we refer, whenever we see the word sons of God, it does not refer to angel coming down into marriage with man. In fact, they are simply the descendants of the righteous line. They are the preserver of truth, the line of the righteous. Remember that Abel had passed away because he was killed. And so Seth replaced him as the son of God. And so Seth's descendants, the sons of God, the righteous people, started to see the daughters of man and that they were more beautiful than those in the church. And as a result, the Bible says that they took them what? Took them wise for themselves of all whom they choose. That's the key word. They didn't think of the, 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 the principle of what God was telling them. They just choose whoever they want. Either they were righteous or not, they just choose whoever they want. Verse 2, they were what? Giant in those days. And by the way, friend, whenever you see this word giant, it doesn't simply mean that they were stature or as far as the, 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 the height itself. Because remember that Adam was a giant. He was the first man created. And the woman as well, Eve. They were the first people that were created. In fact, we will see one day an increase in size when we get to heaven. Imagine when you get to heaven, you see Adam and he's all the way out there in the ceiling. And I said, wow, that is my great, 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 and all the way parents. And man, you are so tall. But guess what? The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 21 that the tree, the leaves of the tree, when you eat of the leaves of the tree, the healing, it will be for the healing of the nation. And so guess what? I might be the shortest person in this room, but one day I'm going to catch up to Adam. I'm going to be eating that, 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 that leaves of the tree of life and I will catch up to him. Because the trees, of the, the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation. Imagine, that's just the leaves. Imagine if you eat the fruit. Oh, that's going to be beautiful, isn't it? And in fact, friend, I get excited when I talk about heaven because I know that we have loved ones whom we missed. And one day we're going to get there. And friends, that is a beautiful thing. And by the way, that fruit, the tree of life, is a beautiful thing because he said that it bears fruit, 12 manners or 12 kinds of fruit every month. That means every single month, that fruit does not repeat itself. Imagine for eternity, every single month, different kind of fruits. I wish we could talk about more of that. That's not our main topic. But I get excited when I talk about heaven. I mean, I hope you do too, because I know that that's one thing that we look forward to. And so the Bible is in verse 2, and there, there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the what? The daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of what? Renown. So when you look at the context, those giants were giant of renown. And that, by the way, then, is in intellect. They were giant in intellect. They were smart. Because remember, they have retained from all the way to creation up to them. And so there were giants in the land. But the Bible said that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were more beautiful than the daughters of God. You see, friends, the children of God married the children of Cain. And polygamy had been early introduced right here, contrary to the divine arrangement at the beginning, which was the Lord gave Adam how many wives? Just one wife, that's all he could handle. Amen. And I could only handle one. Amen. My wife is here and I could only handle one. Amen. And so God gave Adam one wife, show, showing his order in respect. But after the fall, men choose, that's the key word, men choose to follow their own sinful desire. And as a result, crime 
richness and, and, and violence rapidly increase. Whoever the, they coveted as a wife, they took them by force. And men exalted their deeds of violence. But friend, what's, what's so sad about this story is that those who knew better, those who knew better, instead of following the guidelines that God gave them, they started to follow what the world was practicing. Remember that during this time, there were two camps. How many camps? There was two. The sons of God and the daughters of men. Or the sons of men. In other words, the signs that were the righteous and those who choose to follow their own path. Only two ways. And as a result, there is always this distinction between God's people and the world. Those who choose to follow the world. And I don't believe that the, 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 the daughters of men were more beautiful than the daughters of God. Because, friends, beauty is not just simply in your face and in your figure. The world said that if you had a six-pack, right, and you look like a model, that you are beautiful. But, friend, that is a false assumption. What happened when you give it time and gravity? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about, right? Give it time and gravity, and that beautiful face will look something else. Just give it many years, and that will look different. You see, friends, beauty... Too often in the eyes of the world, it's just the face and the figure. But God looks at beauty differently than the world looks at. He looks at the heart. You see, friend, there are three different kinds of people. There are people who have beautiful face and they have beautiful heart. They're called pretty, pretty. But then those people who, who, who have beautiful face but they have ugly heart, they're called pretty ugly. <laughs> Amen. And then there's some who, are, who have ugly face and that they had ugly attitude. They're called ugly, ugly. And then there's some who, oh, actually four now, I'm adding one. So there's four, those who had beautiful face, but also beautiful character. I, say, I think I said that, right? Pretty, pretty. You see, friends, God is not looking for a pretty face. He's looking for, for pretty hearts. And this is what's going on in the story. The people of God, the children of God, they went to look for the wives outside of God's guidelines. And they are dangerous to this friend. You see, friend Noah and his family, we don't know exactly what happened. You see, friend Noah and his family were not the only believers. They were a whole entire line of the sons of God, the descendants of Seth. There's a whole camp of the sons of God who were believers, yet we don't hear about them. Then you have the entire extended family of Noah, his brothers and sisters. In fact, Noah had siblings. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 30. It says, and after Noah was born, Lamech, that's his father, lived how long? Another 595 years and had what? had other sons and daughters. In other words, Noah is the oldest brother of the family. And then after Noah, he had many brothers and sisters after him. But friends, we have not heard anything about his brothers or his sisters. We have not seen them get on board the ark. What happened to his extended family, to his siblings, to his brothers and sisters? Have they been helping Noah in building the ark? Did they got the invitation to get on board the ark? I'm sure, and I, I'm pretty sure they have, because they're younger than Noah. And I'm sure many of them had helped building the ark. But Noah is the only person and his wife and his three children and their wives who got on board the ark. Next, week we will, next time we will discover what happened, seven reasons why. People did not board the ark. And friend, the reality is that God wants us to board the ark. But many times we choose to follow our own way. We choose to follow our own path. And it is a dangerous path when we deviate from the word and commands of God. It's a very dangerous direction. You see, friends, marriage is an important topic in the Bible. And it is especially dangerous when we disregard God's 
command. Notice what it says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 tells us why God tells us not to intermarry outside those who are unbelievers. He said, nor shall you make, Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4, nor shall you make marriages with them. Talking about the Canaanites in the land. You shall not give your what? Daughter or to, their, to their son or take their daughter for your son. Number verse 4. What is this? For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. Speaking about intermarriage, God forbid it because he knows that when we married into the outside or, or unbelievers, the Bible said that they will. It didn't say they might, but what does it say? They will. They will turn your sons or your daughters away. And so how dangerous is that, friend? God, knowing the influence that unbelievers will bring into the family, he gives us ahead information. You see, friends, it is dangerous not only for you, but also for your children. You see, the foundation of society is the family. So when families are broken, then the end result is that the society will be broken as well. Just look around. Just look at our society, how broken it is today. We have so many children in foster home, so many children that need loving parents because their own parents have forsaken and have rejected them because those parents have come from broken home themselves. It's a cycle of never-ending deja vu. It continues over and over and over again. How's our society today? That's the exact results. Broken family often produce broken family. The danger of marrying unbelievers is that the consequences is huge. The church became one with the world. And this is exactly what happened. But you may say, uh, uh, Pastor, you know, it's none, it's none of your business. And I agree with you. It's none of my business. But I just want you to understand that there are consequences to our choices. You can argue that people outside the church might be better than the people in the church. And I say yes. A lot of time, outside marriages and outside, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, they are actually a little bit better than those in the church. I agree with you in many ways. But you see, friends, even though that is true, it should not cause us to look out there. We should look at the Word of God and what does God says. You may even say, well, look at the church statistic, Pastor. Look at the church statistic when it comes to divorce. And friends, it's sad because the church statistic is almost the same as the word. In fact, at time, it is higher. The church divorce is higher than the world sometimes. But friends, when you are simply looking at all of these things, I'm telling you that you are looking at the wrong example. Because even in the church, I know people who have great marriage. I know people who, have, who are a great example of marriage. People who've been married for 10, 20, 30, 70 years. My, my, my wife's great, uh, grandparents was a great example. They've been married for 78 years. And even to the day that they died, they were never separated, not even one day. And when grandpa died, grandma sat beside on his deathbed. And what grandma said is that one day when, when you get to heaven, look for me because I will look for you. Those were the parting words of a 78 marriage. So friends, look at those good examples. I know that they are bad example. I know that many spouses have made mistakes. But friends, don't look at those bad examples. Because when you look at bad example, you will eventually follow this example. Those examples are supposed to teach us and to learn to look for the good ones. Amen? Remember, friend, that marriage is not a joke. It is a lifetime commitment and an eternal commitment to the Lord. You got to think about the eternal risk and consequences and reward when you get into that relationship. But you say, Pastor, I know spouses who have married unbelievers, non-believers, and then they win their spouse to the Lord. 
But also, I want to tell you that I know many people who have married unbelievers and they never won their spouses to the Lord. There's many examples from both ways, but those should not be our example. Our example should be looking into the Word of God. What does He say about marriage? What does He say about the consequences of disobedience to this, to this principle? You see, friends, what we need to do is learn. Learn from what God says and learn from great example of what marriage should be. I know that in this room and in this church, we have people who have been married for a very long time, and thank you for your example. My wife and I were coming into our seven-year anniversary, and we have a lot to learn. And Daniel and, and, and Valencia, too, they're a young couple, and so uh, we have a lot to learn from you folks. Those of you who had been married for a long time, thank you for your example. You had been a blessing to us. And sometimes you might think you're not influencing. No, you are. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at your marriage. And how will you treat your wife and your husband? But thank you for being an example to us and to the rest of the church family. But friends, it is so dangerous. Marriage to an unbeliever is so dangerous that God, in the book of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, the problem with the book of Nehemiah is that people have married intermarriage into non-believers. And as a result, those who had married other people beside their own who believe in God could no longer speak the language. And as a result, they could not speak the language, so they could not read the law or understand what God says. And there was confusion. And friend, this is really literally true in our day. What happened when uh, two people do not agree in the principle either to educate their children in the ways of God or in the ways of the world? There is conflict in the family. Isn't that right? So there will be conflict, constant conflict in the family. One spouse wants to teach their kid to be good, and another said, whoa, I don't really care about that principle. One spouse wants to take their children uh, to, to, or educate their children in a certain way, but then the other said, I don't agree with that. One spouse wants to feed their children healthy food. The other one said, I don't know about that because I love what I love. I don't want to say it because you know what I'm talking about, right? So there's always going to be this conflict in the family. You see, friends, too often children are broken because of the result of marriage. The children has to choose or forced to choose between their mom or their dad's religion too often. This is really true in a lot of ways. Amen? The mistake of mixed marriages was so bad in the days of Noah that God stepped in and did something about it. You see, friends, if you are one of those, if you're one of those who married an unbeliever, you're stuck now. You, have, you, you can't just say, you know what, because pastor said I shouldn't marry an unbeliever, I'm going to have a divorce because I married an unbeliever. No, that's not what I said. Amen? If you married an unbeliever, you should be even more faithful to the Lord and to your spouse. Because by your example, hoping that by your example, you can influence your spouse for the kingdom of God. Amen. You should do all you can. If you used to pray, pray praying once a day, you should pray twice a day. If you used to pray praying twice a day, you should pray four times a day. If you used to pray praying three times a day, now you should pray six times a day. You should double your effort to win your family. Lord, save my family. That should be what we should do. So if you're married and unbelievers, you should be faithful. And yes, I praise God that many of you have won your spouse to the Lord. And for those who have not, keep praying. Keep agonizing with the Lord. Keep doing what you're doing for your family's sake. Do all that you can. You see, friends, learn from your parents. Learn from your grandparents' mistake and other people's mistake. I've heard it said that you are wise when you learn from your mistake, but you are wiser when you learn from other people's mistake because you don't have to repeat it. Amen? Both of my parents, as an example, even within both believers, my, both, my parents were both Adventists, 
but only one were really practicing the lifestyle. And as a result, there was always conflict in the family. There was always uh, uh, alcohol, and there was always a cigarette, and there was always fighting and fussing and, and bickering, and even with physical and, and whatnot. There's always problem in the family because one of the spouse doesn't live out the life that God wants them to live. And you might say, well, you know, there's always problem with believers and their spouses, but imagine if there's problem with the believers, imagine what the unbelievers are going through. Amen? So friends, I'm not condemning those who marry outside. I'm simply saying that if you had married to that spouse, you got to do what you can to save your family. Amen? And for those young people who think that they know better, well, history or, 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 or testimonies of others will tell you otherwise. We got to listen to the word of God. So as a result of these mixed marriages, as a result of this intermarriage between the sons of God and the daughters of man, notice what verse 5 of Genesis tells us. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Notice what it says. Are you, are you still following? We are in Genesis 6, 5. What is the first word? It says what? Then. What is that word then? You see the word then is an adverb. I've learned a little bit from my English teacher, I told you, right? Uh, I might not have the highest grade, but I pay attention a little bit here and there when I'm awake in the classroom, right? And so that word then is an adverb. It's a, it's a word or a phrase that modifies or qualifies for an adjective. What that simply means is that that word uh, then is a connection to what the sentence before in other words, whatever happened before, as a result, then is a connecting adverb. It comes right after it's the consequences of the verses before. Notice what the consequences is. Then, the Lord, what did the Lord saw? Saw that the wickedness of what? Of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, as a result of these mixed marriages, the principle of God was mixed with the world. And as a result of this, then, this is what comes next. The adverb, the, 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 the conjunction, the, 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 the connecting phrase is that then. This is exactly the result when there is this mixed marriages. There will be ungodliness. And as a result, the Bible said that there was wickedness in the earth. It was great. The wickedness was so great that the Bible says that every, what is the word? Every intent. What is the word intent? You know, when, you, when, you, um, when you're walking and you stumble, was that an intention for you to stumble? That was what we call accident. But when, you, when somebody is walking and you put your feet so that they stumble. That was your intent. Your intent was to make them what? Stumble. So the Bible said that intent is basically intentional. It's something that you have chosen to do. You didn't uh, cause it as an accident, but it's an intention. That was really what you want to do. It's a willful choice. And he says the intent, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was how? Was only evil continually. Nothing good comes out of it unless one changed their way. So this is what happened here, friends. As a result of verses 1 through 4, the mixed intermarriage of the sons of God with the daughters of man, as a result of this, there was such wickedness that God looked and he saw that every single heart was only evil continually. And they have no, they have no uh, intention of going back. They just wanted to continue in their ways till the end. As a result of their wickedness, God responds in verse 6 and 7. And then God says, and the Lord, what's the word? And the Lord was what? Sorry. Was sorry. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. The word grieved, friend, that means your heart is breaking. And I know that that is also what happened to parents when their kids ran away. When their kids choose the wrong path, 
the children choose the wrong path and their parents are grieved, their hearts are breaking, God's heart is breaking. And too often, friend, we picture God as someone who wants to judge. But friend, even in this wording, the Bible says that God was grieved. His heart was breaking and he was sorry. For the first time, we hear God saying he was sorry. And then it's repeated again. So the Lord, verse 7, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, every creeping thing, and birds of the air. If I am, how, what again? Sorry that I have made them twice. Nowhere in the Bible does God ever says sorry before this. But now he was. His heart was breaking. Too often we look at this as God punishing people. But friends, God does not punish without his heart breaking. In fact, punishing people is not God's nature. God's nature is saving and giving life. But when people choose to die, God can't force their decision to live. And if you don't want to go to heaven, God will not force you to go to heaven because heaven will be a place of misery for those who do not choose to go to heaven. And God's heart was breaking. He was grieved at heart. His heart was breaking. I don't know how to express this to you, friend, but you are parents. You know exactly what that is. When your kids have done something wrong and there's nothing you can do about it, your heart breaks. God, as our Father, His heart breaks. And too often we only look at this as judgment. But no, God is love and His heart breaks. Whenever one of us refuse to obey his will. Because by refusing to obey his will, we automatically choose death. Because if we don't choose life, we choose death. And that's what people were choosing. They choose death rather than life. This is what Proverbs and the book of Job tells us. That those who do not choose life, choose death. Paul says that, do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves to obey, you are that servant to whom you yield yourself to obey. In other words, if you do not choose good, you automatically choose bad. Because there is no neutrality. There is no neutral ground when it comes to eternal reality. Either you serve God or you don't serve God at all. So God's heart was breaking. God's heart was breaking because he has to bring punishment into the world. But would God destroy everything and everyone? Thankfully, in verse 8, the Bible tells us that Noah, but Noah found what? What did Noah found? He found grace in the sight or in the eyes of the Lord. This is verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Of the Lord. What did Noah found? He found grace. Now I know that there are many people who say grace can only be found in the New Testament. And I disagree 100%. Why? Noah was saved by grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see this word grace is not new. It's not a New Testament thing. It's all over the Bible. Amen. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. So what is this grace that we're talking about? How did Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord? Because too often people say that the New Testament believers, they will go to heaven because they found grace. But then the Old Testament people, they say that the, 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 the Old Testament people will go to heaven because they kept the law. That is thoroughly 100% wrong because both old testament people they were looking forward at the cross and as today we are looking backward at the cross so for those who believe in the old testament and for those in the new testament and us today we are all saved because of the cross jesus is the ultimate grace that paid for both the sins of the Old Testament people and the sins of the New Testament. So we are all saved by simply grace. You can't get to heaven one day and you come up to Father Abraham or to Noah and say, Wow, Noah, you got here by your works. I just got here by grace. I didn't have to do a thing. You see, grace is found both where? Old Testament and where? In the New Testament. So there are people who assume 
that the Old Testament is all about law. Friend, the Old Testament isn't about law. The Old Testament is about grace. And every time God brings punishment, He always shows grace, His mercy and His grace. In fact, God revealed Himself to Moses and He said, Moses, you can't see me, but you will see my back. And when God passed by, the Lord declared He is long-suffering, merciful, and gracious. That's His character. In the Old Testament, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But the question that I want to ask is, how does one show that they are saved by grace? A person who is saved by grace, friends, will demonstrate grace in their lives. Amen? Remember that grace is given so that we can live a holy life. Grace is given so that we can what? Live a holy life. Grace is not given so you can break the law. Grace is given so you don't live in disgrace. Amen? Those people who claim that grace is given so that we can break the law is living in disgrace. They are turning God's grace into disgrace. That's what grace is, to live a holy life so that we can be obedient. Well, what can we find or where can we find that Noah lived by grace? It's through his lifestyle. How was Noah, how did Noah demonstrate grace in his life? Notice what it says in verse 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9. Verse 9 comes after verse what? Verse 8. What did we find in verse 8? Grace. Now, if you know your number, you know that 8 comes before 9, right? Were you taught in school that... Eight comes before nine. So eight was Noah found grace. And then verse nine show how he demonstrated that grace. Notice, this is the genealogy of who? Noah. Noah was a what? A just man. Perfect in his generation. Noah walked with what? Walked with God. So Noah, the Bible said that Noah in verse eight found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah demonstrated God's grace by living an example exemplary life. He lived as a just man. What does that mean? He was fair in his dealing. We have talked about this. In a day where there is social injustice, God calls us to live a just life, to be fair to the people that we see every day. And Noah was living a perfect life. My friend, this word perfect, it doesn't mean that Noah have arrived. <laughs> There is a lot of uh, misunderstanding about this word perfect. They think that you won't, you won't have struggle anymore. They think that you, you, you won't fall anymore. That word perfect simply means that Noah had become spiritually mature. That word perfect simply means that Noah has, has grown. He is growing in the Lord. Because Noah, later on, he got drunk. <laughs> you remember? But yet God said that Noah was perfect. But yet Noah got drunk. That's sad, isn't it? But yet God declared him to be a perfect person. It means he was spiritually mature. He was willing to do what God asked him to do. That's what perfect simply means. Perfection is that you are willing to do what God tells you. And that you will not sin because you love God. That's what perfection is. And then the Bible said that he was perfect in a generation. And Noah, what did he do? He walked with God. Noah demonstrated God's grace in the way he lived. He did not become a disgrace, but he walked with the Lord. Now the question I want to ask you is that, what does that mean to walk with God? You see, there are three things that Noah did in his life to save his family. And these three things is our closing time. Noah walked with God. What does that mean to walk with God? What does that mean? You see, friends, to walk with God simply means to obey His commandments. If you want to save your family, learn to walk with God like Noah did. As a spiritual leader of your home, we need to learn to walk like Noah walked with God. He was faithful. 
He showed the evidence of grace in the way he lived his life. Notice what it says in chapter uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16. What does this word walk simply mean? Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 16, the Bible says, I command thee this day to what? To love the Lord thy God. To what? To walk in his ways and to keep his commandment. Now notice this. He said to walk in his ways and that word and is simply a connecting word. You love the Lord your God and then to keep his commandment. This is what it means to walk. It says, and his commandment, and his statutes, and his judgment, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So what does it mean to walk with God? It simply means to what? To love the Lord thy God, and to what? To keep his commandments. That's what it simply means. To be obedient to all that he said. Notice what Psalms 119 verse 1 tells us. It says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk. Why are they undefiled? Or, or, or those who are not defiled? Because he said they walk in the law of what? Of the Lord. So what it means to walk with God? It simply means that Noah was obedient to the word of God or to the law of God. You see, friends, people think that when you obey the Ten Commandments, you are legalist. They think that when you keep the Ten Commandments, you are actually an Old Testament dispensation. You're actually from the old ways. You just, we don't have to keep that law anymore because we are now saved by grace. Noah disagree. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and that grace is demonstrated in his walking by keeping the Ten Commandments in his life. That's what grace is. That's, it's not a disgrace. Amen? To disobey is a disgrace. You see, let me just give you this example. A uh, couple, couple weeks ago, I was driving, <clears throat> and a police pulled me over. <laughs> and uh, the police pulled me over, and, sir, did you know that you were going 10 miles above the speed limit? I said, I'm... I didn't know, I'm, I'm sorry, and here's my license, and here's my registration, and here's my insurance. And he took it, he said, just give me a minute. He went to his car, checked it up, came back, and he said, sir, here you go. I'm just giving you a warning this time, okay? He let me go. And guess what I did? I put on my seat belt, and I put on my gear to drive, Guess what? As he was walking to his car, I started to rub that gas so fast that he started spitting dirt in his face as I was driving off. You think that's what I did? <laughs> he gave me grace. And I was so careful in putting my feet in the gas pedal so that I don't aggravate him so that his grace will not turn into a disgrace. Amen? He let me go. He gave me grace. And I was so thankful, and I don't want his grace to turn into disgrace by speeding. So I went and I followed the speed limit because the police officer was nice to me and he gave me grace. So grace does not give me the license now to drive 100 miles per hour. It give me the sense, you need to drive more careful. You need to obey the law because the police officer gave you grace. grace. That's what grace is. It's not to break the law. It's to help you be obedient. Amen? It's not so that you can be saved when you keep the law. You are already saved by grace, and now you're keeping the law because of God's grace. And Titus tells us, Titus 2.10, he said that grace is given to live a holy life. That's what the Bible tells us. And so, friend, Noah walk with God. Noah walk with God. So what does it mean to walk with God? It simply means to what? To obey his commandments. And in fact, it's demonstrated in Noah's life. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, and Genesis 7, verse 5. It says, thus Noah did... According to what? All that God commanded him, what did he do? He did. So he did. Verse 
5 of chapter 7. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded, what? Him. Obedience. Faithfulness to his commandments. He demonstrated walking with God. What does it mean to walk with God? He kept his law. He demonstrated grace in the way he lived. Friends, we who are saved by grace should live a careful life. We should live a life that show God's grace in our life. We don't break the law, amen? Because breaking the law is turning God's grace into disgrace. So I hope when the police officer gives you grace, you go and don't start spinning your tire and spitting dirt on his face. But you know what? Too often that's what we do to God's grace. New Testament believers think that that's what we, we should do. But that is not so. You see, friend, this is exactly what it means to walk in the law of God. By your loving example, you can make a powerful impact on your family. When you say, Lord, save my family, you got yourself to obey what God has told you. So that by your influence, your family can see that you love Jesus. Amen? Amen. Number two. Noah was a preacher and a missionary. He was a preacher and a missionary. And what does that mean? Noah preached a message of hope. Noah preached a message of hope. Notice what 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of what? Of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Noah was preaching. He was a preacher. He was preaching that the flood was coming. You see, friend, you cannot be called a preacher if you have nothing to preach about. If you preach only what the magazine or the politics says, you're actually not a preacher. If you're only preaching what feels good, that's not real preaching. Real preaching is pointing people to the reality that they are lost and that they need a Savior, Jesus. Amen. So Noah had something to preach about. And Noah was called a preacher of what? Righteousness. That word righteousness simply means right living. Amen. The right type of living. The right type of lifestyle. So Noah was preaching the right kind of living. He was preaching. And you know what? Noah preached the message for 120 years. We're going to find out that next time. That is a long, long time. Noah was preaching for 120 years and he said, the flood is coming. The flood is coming. And Noah preached this message for 120 long years. That's what verse 3 tells us of Genesis 6. Imagine, friends, preaching for 120 years. He was preaching the same exact message every day. Imagine that. Right? Imagine your pastor preached the same message every week. For 120 years. Many of you probably will not come back next Sabbath. We say, well, Pastor, we have heard that again. Well, we've heard it for 100 times. Okay, Pastor, I think we need to preach another, or we need to hear something else. Right? You probably will get tired. But Noah preached it when people want to listen, and Noah preached it when people didn't want to listen. He just preached the word. The flood is coming. You see, friends, people can't stand listening to God's word today. They would rather hear smooth things and, and who wins the debate. But friends, we're not about politics. We're not about any. We are all about preaching the word. Amen. And friends, if we can't stand hearing the word for one hour, what makes us think that we're going to stand in the presence of God for eternity? when we can't even enjoy the Word of God for an hour? What makes us think that we're going to enjoy God for the, or the rest of the eternity? You see, friends, sometimes prayer and, and Bible study is boring. That's because we don't have a connection with Jesus. We need to have a connection with Him so we can enjoy what He says in His Word. Amen? And so Noah was preaching for 120 years. And friends, he also, Noah, was preaching and he had a PowerPoint. <laughs> he was, you know what his PowerPoint was, his illustration? He was hammering with his hand on that ark. 
every day. He had an illustration and he had the word to preach. That's pretty amazing. For 120 long, long years. You see, friends, Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Because by preaching, friends, sometimes I wonder why God called me. It's not so that I can preach to you. It's because he wants to save my soul. And by serving God, I realize my own in inadequacy, my own failure, my own stammering tongue. Too often I, can't, I mispronounce words I don't even know. That's because English is my maybe third, fourth, fifth language. When I was growing up, my first language was Mama, right? <laughs> my second language is Tagalog or, or, or Ilongo. And then we had to learn Ilo, uh, Tagalog, my third language. And then when I moved to Hawaii as a boy, we have Pidgin English. It's not proper English. And then I came to the main and I had to learn proper English. And still, I don't know. But I don't care. I mispronounce and I don't say it right sometimes, but that's not important. The word is important, amen? amen? It's the intent of what God wants to communicate to us. Preach the word. Be, 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 be instant in season and out of season. Keep working for the Lord. If people want to hear it or if people do not want to hear it, I will preach the word. You see, friends, share Jesus with others. So Noah was preaching the good news of salvation. The third thing that we learn about Noah. The third thing that we learn about Noah is that Noah was a man of faith. You see, friend, faith is a demonstration of your belief. In other words, it's the way you live that faith which you profess. So Noah, he was walking by faith. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 7, our scripture reading that we had today. By faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not yet, what? Seen as yet. What did he do? He moved. You see, Noah's faith was not just simply an abstract faith. It was a living, active faith. He moved. He did something about his faith. With fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his what? Of his house. So friends, sometimes God is just asking you, you to do something. It's not to save the world, but to save yourself and your family. Amen. That's what God is trying to do. When you make lifestyle changes, it's not because you want to change people outside of you. No, because God wants to change your family through you. That's what God wants to say. And God doesn't save family at the same time. He saved family one at a time. Amen. And sometimes it takes a long time. For God, it takes a long time. It's a process saving God, saving our family, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah, he, his faith was put into action. It says by faith, he moved to action to prepare the ark to save his family. When you pray, Lord, save my family are you obedient to the call of god when god tell you i want you to pray for your family right now do you pray at that instant when god tell you i want you to open your mouth right now do you open your mouth at that instant or god says shut your mouth right now do you shut your mouth so that god can work through the person that he's trying to reach because no one move by faith his faith was put into action. You see, friends, Noah, in building that ark, it was a symbol of salvation. That very ark itself was a symbol of salvation. The ark that he was building was a symbol of the New Testament ark, the cross of Jesus. That's why Noah demonstrated his faith in believing that this ark will carry them through the time of trouble. Well, how do we know? As we close now, I just want to point out a couple points here. That the Old Testament ark was a symbol of the New Testament cross and what Jesus will do for his people. Now remember this, friends, that the ark was made of what? Was made of wood. And so does the cross. It is made of wood. And friends, we find 
that the ark only, how many doors? It only has one door. And there's only one door to heaven, and that is to Jesus Christ. You know, if Noah was an architect today, people would laugh at him. There's only one entrance, one exit. That is not good architecture, right? But it was a symbol of salvation. There was only one way in, one way out. It's a symbol of Christ. And then we find that the ark was covered with pitch. I, would, I, I wish we have time to, to, to discuss this. But that pitch was a representation of the blood of Jesus. That pitch covered the outside and the inside of that ark so that it was sealed, so that no water could leak in and no water could go out. It was totally sealed. And when you are covered with the blood of Jesus, you are totally fireproof and you're totally waterproof. Because the weakest person who trusts in Jesus is strong. Amen? So no matter what you struggle, maybe come at the foot of the cross because Jesus will protect you. He will give you the power to overcome. And this is what happened to that. And then the ark saved Noah and his family. Our safety is only in who? In Jesus Christ. Amen? And then God alone. By the way, God alone closed the door. And friends, we know that the door of probation will soon close. And only God can close that probation. And friends, while time is yet open, let's make use of the time that God has given us to obey His will. And then lastly, those inside the ark was carried to safety and only those who are inside Jesus Christ will be carried to safety one day. That's why Noah obeyed, because that ark was a representation of salvation in the New Testament. So friends, we find that Noah walked with God. He was faithful in walking with God. The question is, how are you in your relationship with Jesus? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you sharing his word? Are you walking by faith? You're demonstrating that faith in your life. Is Christ the solid foundation in your life? Because friends, with Jesus in the family, happy, happy home. And brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you today. God is calling you to walk with God. If you are praying, Lord, save my family, it must begin with you. It must begin with me. It can't begin with my spouse. It can't begin with your kids. It can't begin with anyone else. It begins with me. It begins with you. So this morning, if you're praying, Lord, save my family, you've got to ask the Lord, Lord, begin with me. If that is you today, I just want you to raise your hand where you are as we pray together, as we pray this prayer, Lord, save our family. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our hands are raised because we are praying that you would please save our family. But Lord, please begin with me. Begin with us first in this room right now. Help us, O oh God, by our lives and our example so that we could share the message of Jesus to our family. Sometimes you're not calling us to any distant land but you're simply calling us in our family to be the witness to the, and testify to the goodness of God's grace. And so, Lord, I pray that you would see our hand. This is a sign of our commitment. It's a sign that we love you and that we will do what we can for you to save our family. Bless us now, Lord, and guide us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.